<laughs> All right, we're going live now. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm uh, Evan Evans, film composer, and we are joined today. Welcome, by the way. We are joined today with Dallas Crane, composer. Hey, how are you guys doing? And Steven Stratver. Hey, you guys. And Kyle Uhas. Hello, world. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's talk about scoring. Yes. Yes. So well, I had a pretty interesting topic I want to bring up to you guys. Uh, you know, also being like resident nerds. Um, but I, uh, I always was curious about how you guys would say, how you would certainly, how, or how you would approach, um, if you were tasked with say scoring something that was being transcribed from a video game, say a soundtrack that, especially something that was very iconic to that video game, they already had a soundtrack that people just re it just resonated with them. They just connected with it. Um, how important do you think it is, say, if you're going to do a film that's based on something like that, to incorporate that soundtrack? Would you bring it in com just directly, just just every single piece that they had, maybe re rework it slightly, but still you're you're essentially just showing these uh, these pieces off in a format for a, a film score? Or would you take it to where you would take certain themes, maybe you know a certain very important thematic uh, movement, and just focus on that whilst creating your own score around it? How would you maybe approach something like that? Yeah, well, I think that comes up often, you know, because it's not just necessarily from the game world to the film world, mm -hmm. right? You also find that in prequels, sequels, spin-offs, right. reboots, right. Um, remakes, and you know, you know, to to whether or not to use the existing material or not becomes. An important, you know, part of it. Right. I think probably uh, it's dependent a little bit on how much the entire kind of like audience acknowledges that the music was a key factor in the original. Right. Right. Okay. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, the more influence that it has has had previously on an audience, the the more of those elements you're going to want to have to bring to the table. Right. Exactly. Yeah. What's a good example of a score that did that? Uh, I would um, usually I I kind of always reference these two just because I'm just very big fans of them but um, say when you compare like the uh, the Resident Evil film franchise to what Silent Hill did when they started doing a few films uh, for that right. um, you could just tell Resident Evil they wanted to go for a much more mainstream almost an action sort of soundtrack but they would they would s certainly incorporate especially with the original uh, they were incorporating certain kind of unique uh, a little more horror aspect um you know, very distraught sort of sounds. But they also had artists come in, say Rob Zombie or Marilyn Manson, and they had <clears throat> certain aspects they kind of brought to the table, uh, coming from industrial sort of darker, maybe metal rock backgrounds. Um, so they really created something wholly new, entire, you know, whole new entire kind of feel and a whole new entire score. But with Silent Hill, what they did, especially the first film, I didn't really, I don't think I saw the, the, the sequel to that, but the first film, I, I give them a lot of credit because they really, they, they just pulled the songs right from the games. But even if it wasn't used in a certain context how the game would use it, they still would fit it in the scene very well. And for me, those games, I mean, the soundtrack is just so iconic with those games because they're very cerebral. They're very, very psychological. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the soundtrack was such a great reflection of that. Um, so you really couldn't, I don't think you really could delve too far deep. I mean, there are instances, right, where uh, in some games, um, typically like, you know, first-person shooters or something, uh, you can there's like some classic songs you can choose from right to like listen to right, while yes. you're playing the game and uh, you know I guess suppose if they made a, like a movie version of that game that would be so killer if they could right. bring in that song you know so that's a good example yeah. yes exactly yeah. exactly I, I don't know if you saw the film Assassin's Creed I didn't actually know yeah I kind of it, was, it was okay it was okay yeah. um, and I'm not super familiar with Assassin's Creed in general but you know I, I feel like. That was kind of an example of, of a film that was trying to reach an audience that was different than the audience for the game. Yeah. Like I, they had they had the love for it, but I, I think the uh, there's just probably not enough of the Assassin's Creed audience to satisfy what the film audience would need. So I'm pretty sure they went mainstream um, with that sound. The other kinds of movies I think <clears throat> that are kind of a sandbox for all this kind of stuff are like fan films. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to YouTube for any game, you can just look up fan films, and these are, like, sandbox kinds of things where, you know, like, uh, Metroid Prime, people, you know, dress up as Samus, and then they run around, you know, for a little while and make a little four-minute movie, and so, obviously, there's not a, 
a lot of expertise in those films, but you can tell right away just the different approaches that they use. Right. There can be original music, there's derivative music, there's, you know, just taking the old soundtrack and putting it in. I've heard some, you know, reorchestrations of video game music. Yes. Um, you know, there are a lot of different options. I think the questions you need to ask are, you know, what is the film saying differently? What can the melody do besides just that nostalgia factor? Maybe there's a moment where you can satisfy that kind of pandering to the audience. But besides that, you know, you need to have the discipline to do the right thing, not just the, uh, the lazy strategy. Um, I'm excited to hear about the new Mario movie by Illumination. Oh, doing that. Oh, wow. I, I've heard... Oh, wow. I haven't heard... I think I've read an article like a year ago or something on it. I don't know what's going on with it. As long as John uh, John Leguizamo replies, or reprises his role as Luigi, I'll be all over <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, um, no, but I, uh, I, I... It's interesting that you brought... I mean, because... Exactly. You kind of have to take into effect, like, are we still trying to convey the same message the game had? Are we trying to build upon it? Because you look at the the film, say, compared to, like, Resident Evil to the games, they're, they're full-out action movies. So you, you understand those soundtracks wouldn't work for the movies. They just wouldn't have. It just would have been it would have been such a stark contrast where it's like, well, this is a very tense, ambient sort of sound that we're trying to build upon right now. And yet guns are going off and explosions are happening. It just doesn't fit. Um but like I said, but when you do something, say Silent Hill, and you have you're, you're still trying to capture that same ambient but yet very disturbing, almost industrial kind of soundscape. You you really there's no other way to go but to go and reference that soundtrack again. You you kind of have to show yeah. that. You know? mm-hmm. I I think you know there's some melodies that have evolved beyond the game and have become mainstream, and so those are ones that are pretty strong. But besides that, I think you kind of have a lot of freedom. You know, like the original Super Mario Brothers, like World One theme, is you know the dun 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 da 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 dun. That's that's pretty classic. That one's pretty hard to replace. But if you look at the entire canon of Mario games, you know every new game has completely new music. Exactly, it's completely replaced. But it all feels the same because it's that same emotional quality and it's the same composers. And you know, obviously, there's no reason why you can't create you know more artistic variations of the same emotion. I almost see Nintendo as kind of the Disney of video games in certain ways because it's like you said that they have the same composers but I feel like when you're hearing like a certain Nintendo soundtrack whether it's Mario or even Donkey Kong or something like that it it does it has a certain quality to it that you're always kind of expecting you know what I mean especially when it comes to Mario games Um, I think it's what you said it's always a different soundtrack but you're but you're walking into it like say you're going to go see um, the new the new uh, Mary, uh, Mary Poppins movie where it's like you're expecting a certain level you know, and I think they always do deliver on that. Good point. They do. Absolutely. You know, they, I mean, it's you're you're hearing all the sounds you're expecting to hear, but maybe new concepts, new ideas. Just That's just a little bit like what I was mentioning in the beginning there. Where exactly. It's like, what is the audience perception of right. how important it is to pay tribute to the original music or right. not? You know, um, yeah, it might not always be so key. You mm-hmm. know, and and maybe you don't really have to pay as much tribute as you think you do. Like there are some Star Wars games out there that you know they open with you know the Star Wars music or a certain cue not necessarily the main title but just some cue and people are like oh awesome thanks for letting me know that yeah, exactly. you care and then <laughs> from there it goes on to original stuff yes. that's great yeah. yes. mm. so it could be just as minimal as that almost like a, a very friendly kind of bait and switch where it's like that's very welcome <laughs> but now it's like I want to show you something yeah now yeah I have like, you. like Rogue Squadron like the main theme to Rogue Squadron oh, is, yes. is classic it's original but you know it opens with you know some Star Wars basic Star Wars stuff and you know you get you get a little bit of everything Shadows of the Empire was almost exclusively clips from Empire Strikes Back yeah I remember that yeah they didn't really go too far I don't think that. yeah I don't, well they had the well actually they did have Joe McNeely's score mixed in there too so there's that original oh I don't know but you can't tell because it's so good it's so yeah it was, they just kind of seem yeah so. it blends so well together but and that's yeah. actually I have to go back and listen to Rogue Squadron again. Yeah. It's been that a is a movie time. they need to make is yes. Shadows of the Empire and Rogue Squadron <laughs> just saying Oh, but man. yeah, so and I don't think there's really a solid way to say, and I don't think the uh, the music is all that as locked in as we think because we we like it and we yeah. listen to it, but like really, I think I, a, I think a good example of of that is, for instance, uh, let's just pick a few historically remade movies after thirty, forty, fifty years later. You know, um, Italian Job. 
what's that? The Italian, Italian job. job. Yeah. I mean, it was just totally, re- the music was completely rebooted and it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, both of them were fantastic. Both of them are great. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, another one might be like The Fly, mm-hmm. which was originally like a really, uh, you know, gory classic uh, score in its time. Well, they did the same thing, but they didn't do the same music. They just did now how far we had progressed with the score. Right, right. They did a really gory you know, score. What about, what's that space TV show that John Williams did? Yeah, it was like different every season. Oh, yeah, Lost in Space. Lost in Space. There you go. Yeah, it changed every season, right? Yeah. So even, it's not even a reboot, it's just like every time you look at it, it's different. Oh, we don't have to pay for that, I just sung that. Only if you're streaming on YouTube. Yeah, we are. Damn YouTube. But, yeah, you know, you know, that's pretty integral, don't you think? Yeah. But you could redo that again, you know. That's I think Michael Giacchino is a good example of somebody who's kind of done that, taking the ball of like that classic, whatever those classic musical themes are, and then bringing them over. That was uh, which one with uh, Will Start. Ferrell? Will Ferrell lost, Ferrell lost in oh time. Oh no, oh. Um, it's not lost in space. Yeah, I know. What you're you know, and they have the oh, sleeks. Yeah, yeah, those, lost in time. Those, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, yeah. So, I, try, I, I can't remember the name. Is yeah, it's not lost. It's um. And he, he even did the similar orchestrations and stuff with like the coconuts and the right, you know, right. and the boom, you know, just all the really odd, peculiar yeah. sounds. Now, what about like what was it, Hook and like the original Peter Pan? Yes, like, that was completely different. Music, yeah, completely right? different. Yeah, Hook though. I mean, but that made sense because Hook was about what if Peter Pan forty years later? It acknowledged that this was you know forty years later. You know, was a normal guy. He he had left Neverland, and you know, would he forget himself and lose touch with the fact that he always wanted to be a kid? And let's explore that. You know, and so that's a fresh update. And it even starts with like the dad's a busy corporate, you know, mm-hmm. got a corporate job and stuff, and he can't even be with his own kids. Yeah, but I mean, if you're gonna adapt a video game for a movie, that I assume the settings can always change. I, I think so, but, but maybe not. Like, what about Battle Los Angeles? I mean, that was pretty much, pretty much. The movie version of the game, you know. Okay. You know, so uh, and and I think Brian Tyler did both. Oh yeah. Uh, so you know, it just kind of worked that's out. That's true. They're yeah. like, let's let's just do the movie of the game, you know. Let let's see how yeah, well it. Yeah. Usually does. it's the other way. The movie comes out, and then right as the movie comes out, there's the they game. spin off to the game. Yeah, right? the game's like an exact mimic of the movie. Yeah, for everything, including Disney movies, like. You know, Rapunzel the game, you know. I thought that was yeah. so popular back in the day. Mm. Like, what's like, like I'd say yeah. maybe like during like that two thousand two to yeah, two thousand two PS two era. Like they always had that. Like I mean, they would they have the, the Harry Potter's. Yeah, ex- yeah exactly. The- Lord of the Rings. I yeah. remember like yeah, uh, which actually really good games. Uh, I gotta go back to those. But um, <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting though when you kind of see another like trends like that, and you don't really like the PS three did it a little bit. Like King Kong, like Xbox 360 when that first came out, that was kind of like one of the big launch titles for it, but it kind of oh, dropped yeah, off. You yeah. don't really see that too much yeah, nowadays, it's, where it's now you're getting that shift to where it's like they're making movies now based on game, and it's getting more popular and they're getting better, where they're yeah. focusing on more of that aspect to it. It's almost the reverse now, where yep. a good game will be made into a movie. Exactly. Like, it's, that's how much power a good Assassin's game has Creed, now. You know, yeah. is, is an example of that. To the Tomb Raider re- reboots they just did. Um, they're oh, talking yeah, about that's doing, huge, yeah. Talk about doing a reboot for Resident Evil, which I don't know if it's going to be good or not. I, um, they did uh, Angry Birds. Yeah, I mean, Angry Birds. Didn't they, they actually did that, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did the Angry Birds legit. movie. Like, oh, wow. Even movies based off of apps, you know? I mean, it's... <laughs> but, um... No, I do. I mean, I just, I just think it usually just depends on the actual source material itself depends like you guys said it depends on the audience if you're trying to just pander to certain things if you're trying to build something new um but I mean what I've, one of my favorite actual like orchestral soundtracks is when uh they took the first three uh Resident Evil games and they performed them live it was the New Japan Philharmonic Orchestra mm-hmm. oh, and it was in 1999 and they did this beautiful amalgamation where they would combine certain tracks all together into one they would take one theme from like one part of the game and they would build it into this whole different movement and almost sounded like a John Williams Jurassic Park style but it was done so well um, it was just such a beautiful it was a whole beautiful uh, concert it was a beautiful uh, piece of music and um, that's still the one of my favorite albums to listen to one of my favorite scores I would say to listen to um but even just going back, and if you want to just pick up like just the actual video game soundtrack itself, I would say Silent Hill 2 is probably one of my absolute favorites. It's mm-hmm. such 
a unique and varied soundtrack where they'd have folk rock right next to a hit, like almost like this very lo-fi hip hop song. Mm -hmm. And then it would melt into this really heavy, sort of simple kind of dark rock song to this really industrial ambient soundtrack. Mm -hmm. It was just such a great, varied um, soundtrack, and it and it melded so well with how crazy the story was. And I think that was the whole point of it was. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of, we have no limits on this, so let's do the same thing with the music. And that really transcribed beautifully um, when they actually did the, the movie. The movie itself was decent, um, a little different from the game, but they understood how important it was. And I think mm. it was it just worked out beautifully. So, Very cool. Well, Juan Salsh, uh, over on one of our Facebook streams, uh, asked us the question, do you guys specialize in specific styles, or do you tell the director that you can do anything they ask for? So, sort of like specializing versus do anything. Um, well, specializing, I think, is important because anybody can get anything, you know, from a ton of different sources. The competition is so heavy that if there's not something that nobody can el that nobody can get except from you, then you know, That's right. why would they go with you? Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, the, the problem of dropping, becoming like a jack of all trades. It means that if you, if you can do anything, then you're up against not only everyone else that can do anything, but everyone else who can do each of those things especially well, because they specialize in it. So you're, you're underneath a ton of pressure. Like, you, you know, there's, there's the guys that are just there's the guys that are number one in each of those categories. Then there's the second and third rate copies of those guys. And then you know there's like a whole subculture around being you know that those like be, being like those number one guys. And then you have that every all those people, which there's I find it it's probably misguided to be a person who does anything. And because you're underneath all of those people who are specializing and you're now in a group of thousands of other people who also just can do anything. So now you go in there and you're like, oh, I can do anything. And you become Walmart. Right. Yes. yes. That's what happens. And so absolutely your best foot forward is, is to specialize, limit it down. And you'll find that if you do specialize and you put in the time, several years, five years down the line, you'll notice that you're now one of the top maybe 100 guys on this entire planet at that particular thing. After 10 years, maybe that's going to get up into the top 50, top 40, top 30. It's just going to work well for you. I think a really good example is like Alan Silvestri. For many, many years, he really did specialize. He did a lot of like blockbuster action thrillers not even suspense movies but just action thrillers and then and then at a certain point in which he just like was sitting on top of the world and could say hey you know i, I don't really care if i specialize this or i want to do some kids movies for my kids so then he does uh what's that one stort little yeah Stuart little. yeah stort little and he wanted to do some movie scores to make his kids happy that he could bring his kids to and then he needed polar express and all these mm. all these movies and um so i call that kind of the mushroom effect you know you kind of go you, you specialize in something and you rise you rise you rise to the top and then when you're comfortable making a living with your career and mm. maybe you've got a huge reserve and you know, hopefully you've gotten to the point where you could get yourself a house and then, then you can span out into those other fields and just, you know, satisfy that part of you that just wants to give it a shot, you know? That's interesting. Right. It is, because I think people usually think of that as backwards. They think, oh, I have to kind of oh, yeah. have mm -hmm. this culmination of so many different genres, and then I can go into specialty, and it's, it's uh, funny. You mentioned that. I think, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I think that's much more uh, brilliant to go in that regard, where it's like, yes. specialize. And then, you know, then you can kind yes. of branch out. Use these things you learned as you created this really unique specialization. Yeah. And there's a reason why that is, um, it, uh, because when you start specializing, you start gaining more work because you put in all those hours you put in have been towards just that one yeah. particular. Right, so right. you have more to represent yourself. So now when you go toe to toe with uh, with someone in that same exact specialization, you have a large body of work to compete with against them. If you versus if you only had three tracks or one wow. score or three movies that you did that could compete with another guy who's been doing 30 or 40 of those, you're going to lose that competition. Exactly. So as you specialize, you start winning some of these competition and that's how you get into that top, you know, 100 
people. Right. What, what were you going to say, Stephen? Right in there. No, I mean that that brings up a whole cool thing of like, well, what what can <laughs> maybe we could get into this, but like, yes. how do you specialize in something? I mean, it's interesting. Like, um, uh, who was I talking to? Uh, oh, I was talking to the film composer. Uh, what's the guy's name? He does a lot of horror movies. He was. Uh, uh, he did the sinister or whatever. Oh, um, uh, uh, Baksha. Um, our, n- not him. Uh, but Christopher Young. Oh, Christopher Young. I was telling. Sure. And at one point, he said, "Like I don't know where he did this and when he did this." He said he threw a piano off a roof, <laughs> and he recorded the sound of like this piano smashing, and he used it in the movie. Like oh, he made all awesome. these samples out of it. And he says, "Man, I was creating all my sounds early on." I mean, it wasn't. And he said a lot of composers now rely on all these soundtrack libraries and just. He's like, man, you got to go outside the box, and it's, it's just like, it's. And he's right. It's like, and his sounds, his scores came out really exciting. Like there was one, I, one thing he did, it was like really scary. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but he really Christopher Young, yeah, Hellraiser, Hellraiser, yeah, yeah. It was re- he really he went like really intense on that one. Oh, yeah. uh, Sinister, one of those ones, yeah. So yeah, there was even one he did a really great score. I thought it was and it was just a, a human, just a psychological thriller. And that was copycat. Copycat. Did you ever see that? Yes. No, oh yeah. Oh was, my god. It was that so was... large, so oh, epic oh, yeah. that it made just this little like. The, you remember she was? Uh, I think they call it agoraphobic. Yes. Uh, yes. She's just afraid of going outside. Outside. Yes. yes. And uh, they made just the, her little you know area just seem like an entire universe of fear you know. Yeah. And uh, I think they did that probably with the filmmaking too with the weird angles and everything, <laughs> <laughs> but but the score was just just outstanding. And, and Harry Connick Jr. was an incredible actor in that movie, too. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Sandor Giorfi asks, uh, when, and when do you know or what, when do you know is best time to hire an assistant? How do you know when you got to that point? Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I could probably talk about that for a second. Um, you need an assistant when you're getting consistent work. So meaning you're always busy, right? Um, Before that, you spent the time to run down every gig. So your assistant needs to do two things. They need to help alleviate uh, the the side things that have to be done uh, in order to maintain your life and your career while you're busy scoring and you're busy working. And you have them help you find the new gigs that you're going to be doing next. Okay. You know, um, but of course you can't get to that point unless the projects that you're working on can sufficiently pay for the assistant. Right. So I think that probably comes around. Well, it depends on how industrious you are, but maybe between year four and year eight, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that should be all right. But then, even then, uh, you probably want to start to hire the assistant part time, uh, either half days, or two or three days a week. Right. Okay. Or half days, two or three days a week. Um, these days, the entire you know, with globalization, you know, maybe you can even outsource to um, some other regions of the world to help right. you to help you out. You know, um, but it depends because you you might want a, a musical assistant as well. Someone to drop your tracks into Pro Tools at the end of the day, um, export your tracks at night when you get some rest or in the day when you're getting rest, whenever rest right. is for you. Uh, they can pop on your system. They can hop on your system and do those you know, STEM exports and then importing into Pro Tools. Um, just like, you know, when when the, every fifth project you work on comes with some administrative duties. Yes. And you usually just sort of stay on top of that yourself until you get to the point where you've got to hire it out and that's the whole way that you grow you know you can't grow until you can do more in the same amount of time and you can't do more in the same amount of time unless you have now start adding on and creating your team well, hopefully that answers right. your question yeah. I just wanted to add something yeah. really quickly just at the end of that is like I had a friend who was running an, uh, like an artist management uh firm whatever you want to call it and she got to the point where she did everything herself and she was she spent like she would stay up till 3 a.m in the morning and and it was like for 20 years or 15 years whatever and she didn't hire like she was running it all herself and there was a point where it just wouldn't go anywhere 
And she, you know, I don't know, maybe she felt like she wanted to do everything herself, but that's a good point. Like, you want to, yeah. you don't just want to do it all yourself. You want to know when you can hire it out. Yeah. And, and, and you're going to burn yourself out. Yeah. Yes. You're burn burn yourself. There's not more than 24 hours in the day, and some of those day, hours you got to sleep. And so when you hit your maximum, um, make sure that you couple that sort of with uh, the goal of making sure that it, it brings in enough money to support you because you're not going to have any further hours in order to support yourself. So once right. you hit your peak, you know, and you're fully booked up, then you got to make sure that that's because you've got the, the the money coming in from those to match. So like you know, for instance, it, it takes around three thousand hours to do a score, at labor wise, you know, between your whole team and everything. Um, so you know you got to divide that up. So if you, for instance, three thousand dollars will be a dollar an hour. That's no good. Right. right. So you got to do a little bit of math, and you got to make sure that the projects you do are going to pay for your time. Some of that money, some of that early first few years, of course, of your sort of career building, there is a future value to doing to doing work for whatever value you're getting up front. I mean, you can do work for free. You can even pay to do work because, in the end, you're going to get such great result about, say, having you know um, an orchestra play your piece or a reel like that, or uh, having more credits, like what we were saying, to be able to compete with somebody else in the in your yes. in your in your in your sector. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think just generally um, with the understanding of just any kind of general collaboration, I think it's good for somebody to learn early on how to work with somebody else. Um, whether it be just two composers getting together on a score or composer working with an audio engineer or working with musicians to play a new score. I think it's important to know how to interact with people, how to delegate, how to develop your vision so that you know it in a way that you can explain it to somebody else even maybe before you've you know, written the score because it's no good if you've gone through the whole score and you've had to write it out just so you can figure out how to tell somebody else how to orchestrate it kind of thing. You know? Right. It goes with what, with what Steve said about you know, the friend you had who was doing the business by herself for so many years. I think a lot of artists, I think we could all uh, totally you know, jump in on that saying where we have such a unique vision or an idea that we don't want to get like misrepresented if we hire someone along. We want to make sure they understand we have the same goals and the same outlook and the same sort of vision. And I think that's kind of what creates sort of that like, well, I'll just do it myself. You know, mm -hmm. you 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 you're, you're in a way you're you're protected. Hundred so percent insulated. Yes, exactly. Like mm -hmm. you, I don't want this to. Um, I don't want my idea to kind of be changed at all because I, I really have something certain I'm going for here. And I think that's. I think that might be some of the fear maybe some people have, even when they do reach that point where they're so busy they can't really find any time for anything else. And but I think that's what maybe what might stop them from hiring someone. It's like, well, I don't know if they're going to understand what my actual goal is they're not right. going to get my actual yeah you know? yeah that you've got to be able to you know uh, be out of your own head yes. for a little bit and help with other people exactly and exactly. then you know I think when you're out working it, it helps to be able to call on people to collaborate with you you know to have an engineer to tell a director you know I've got a team I've got an engineer you know I've got a mixer I've got music performance people right. you know all that kind of stuff it's it's good I mean, to be prepared. What do you guys think of the value of being an assistant? I mean, what about the advice of why don't you just try first being an assistant for a year or two or three? You know, and yeah. that goes towards kind of what you were saying, you know? Yeah, well, you've. it's important to be here. To know and just to be working. how to work with them. You could learn that from yeah. someone else by actually first being that. And I think that's a great right. place to start a career probably not all these classical composers who are really artists come necessarily to LA or you know are ready for their big thrust into the world and are ready to you know like be an assistant right you know except that honestly it's just one of the best ways to learn wouldn't you say Steven and that well if you consider you know all of the tasks involved in creating a film score if you're working by yourself you're technically an assistant for yourself for specific tasks until you aren't. So, you know, in music school, you learn this side of the equation, and then it's important that you learn the whole equation. You should be able to do everything in the pipeline from right. start to finish. Um, and there's just a lot of things you learn on the job that you can't learn anywhere else. And 
you're not aware of it, you don't know to ask for it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll just be more primed and ready to, yeah. when that day comes, seven da years down the line, when you do need an assistant, to go like, oh, I know exactly what you need to do. You know, This is how I did it before, you know, for this other person. A right. And I, I find that it's a whole other, like, so I had uh, composed the music to, like, movies without an assistant. I mean, without a, whatever, being an assistant. And it's like stepping up from, like, college ball to the NBA it's like you're getting exposed to a whole world that you wouldn't have seen and you just you you pick so much more it's like you're speeding up your growth you're you're getting all these lessons you're learning lessons like left and right left and right that you wouldn't get I mean you're in real situations you got to deliver that cue on time and a certain day and you better get that thing done and you better work with the other composers and yeah, this, so. goes, this goes happens to go right into Juan Salsh's uh, next question, oh, okay. which is, uh, could we talk a little bit about, you know, music education, getting a degree versus oh. not uh, for film scoring, for film scoring in order to become a film composer. So I could start this off by saying that I think one should get f uh, a complete fluent musical education. However, they do. I, I, I think they should do that. You know, for me, I started very early. I had private lessons. I started going to college when I was 12 years old. I was taking classes. I went to the same school that Spielberg went to when I was 15, you know. And and uh, by the time college came along, uh, I was kind of ready for most people's normal college years. I spent, you know, beginning my professional career. But that wasn't because I didn't get a music education. You know, and I think... Um, it can't hurt to get yourself a music education. The question, is it necessary for you to have a degree to get a job as a composer? That's a bit different. It's, it's absolutely not necessary. It doesn't even factor. It's what you show in your resume, in your tracks, that gets you the jobs. So... You know, that, of course, your musical competence might factor in that, you know. Uh, but, you know, to be an effective film composer is not about musical competence. It's about, it's about storytelling competence. So you can be, I mean, like a good example, maybe I, don't, I really don't know, like Neil Young's be uh, educational background, but I don't think he's... Um, you know, a mm. 20th century classical symphonic composer, as far as I remember. <laughs> right. Notice, I, you know, but so I have some, you know, there's some clues there that maybe he, he's uh, more of like just a folk guitarist that came up through the system and, uh, you know, had some incredible original ways of expressing himself. Well, you know, he's done several film scores and they've been outstanding. Um, that's because he he's communicating all that story, the story, he's expressing story and storytelling. And... That's the competence that filmmakers want. The ones that know what they're doing. The filmmakers that know what they're doing. The ones that don't, you know, they might say, ah, oh, I want you to copy, you know, this previous score. When I, and then you go, oh, I can do that because I was trained in that. No problem. Except that's really probably not the route you should take. Um, you know, that filmmaker is already incorrect because he's making something that's derivative He's asking you to make something that's derivative. And when somebody makes something derivative in the marketplace, it becomes second, third rate versions of all rep products that are already out there and they don't become popular and it's just not a good vehicle for you. Yeah, that's one of my criticisms of uh, the college experience is that the experience is um, behind and so you do get a lot of training that what used to be cutting edge is now derivative. Right, um, right. But there are great experiences in college you make good friends, um, you know, you can work in the industry, you work on that collaborative element. Um, my experience also put me in front of large orchestras and managing, you know, stuff like that, writing for, you know, larger ensembles and all that, and that was really exciting, but, you know, I'd, I'd, if there were, you know, just some magic path, you know, you learn piano when you're four, you go to that school when you're in college, and you graduate and you come out to Los Angeles, and you get this, uh, you know just like boom, 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 suddenly you're a film composer. 
it'd be a little more obvious than it is now. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think there's a specific route. It's, you know, you need, you're really going to school for your own personal education yes, first. Yes. And so you should be chasing after what you need to be taught and what's missing in, you know, the skills that you have. You should be chasing after the, you know, the places that will give you that education. I think and those music, connections, yeah. I think music college is, is interesting because it, it, it's it's just what you said. You're going you're going to educate your 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 yourself essentially. You're going there to. It's not like a business degree. So you go in there, you just kind of get the classes done. You get and you, you you're not really going to apply any of these concepts. Where it's not like that. If you're going for for a music degree, you might think, oh, it's kind of a relaxed sort of. It's 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 not. It's it's you really do have to pay attention because you, these are concepts you will be using in the real world. Depending on your program and how they kind of correlate things, what where I was going at, which was which is really great, it was um, it, it forced you to collaborate with performers or composers. You, you had to because that was within your actual structure, and they wanted they they pushed that. You know, say if like, well, oh, you need you need horns for this section. We'll go to that department, find people, you know, post something or try to set something up through Facebook. Meet meet with them, show off the music. You know, if you help if you need help with uh, you know any kind of you know notation or composing. So a lot of engineers did. Well, okay, well, then go to the actual composing side, have them help you with that. So it, it, it taught you that. It taught you all these uh, really great foundational sort of skills and concepts mm -hmm. that you really have to have. You have to. You can't be afraid to network. You can't be afraid to talk to people. You can't be afraid to mm -hmm. express ideas to someone else and try to, you know, like, hey, I have a certain theme or, or an idea in mind. Um, can you help me with this? Can you help me, you know, push this forward and, and transcribe yeah. it or whatever? Um the second part I, to his, yeah. the second part to his oh. question was kind of, um, you know, how is it possible to get work without a degree? So I think that's kind of like the context that he's trying to ask this. In, you know? it, I mean, it, it looks good. I mean, it does. It, it, it's like anything in this. In, mm -hmm. I mean, our education system in general can be maybe like uh, Dallas. It's a little, maybe a little primal it's, at this point. It's, it needs, it definitely needs to change. But like I said, I think that's why people may snicker at the idea of music college, but. I think it still is one of those institutions that actually does train you, and you do have to. Like, you're you're going to be using those concepts. You're going to be, you know, so don't you have to pay attention to everything. You, in even going outside of that scope and learning more while you're in the program, learning concepts and ideas, and maybe reading an extra chapter in the book that you didn't have to cover, but still, you're like, no, I still want to learn all of this. Oh yeah, I still am learning to this if, day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, if you can, this is another route that I, well, I took, even though I did go to college for music education. On the side, I had been studying piano with uh, a Juilliard professor, so I would recommend if you can find like a mentor mm -hmm. that where you can just – I mean I, I think I learned a lot of what I know today. I can, I can say because I've spent those years with that professor and now I'm doing that with Evan as well. It's like a mentor position. That's almost where – that will accelerate your learning like just man. It's like nothing else like that. Yes. So. That's what I would encourage. If if you know someone out there, I don't know, here maybe in L.A., do you need an – if you want to apply for an assistant position, is it – I don't know. Do you need like maybe an education in music? What are they looking for? I don't know. But if you can find someone like that. Yeah, I'll add to that too. A yeah. lot of my favorite moments in my college education were the extra extracurricular moments yes. that I chased after myself. There are a lot of music grants that I went after. You know, I – um, I ran a studio orchestra group for a few years um, where we recorded music for films um, on the campus and then also I was the like kind of production head director of animation development so I developed an animation, wrote music for it, did the storyboards, got some animation done for that, um, you know we had VR games that we did nice. and that was all extracurricular nice. you know so that was stuff that we like built ourselves and I think that was that was better than a lot of the classes, which were, yeah. you know, I, I felt, you know, understaffed, and there are a lot of people wanting to be film composers, so, you know, there's this white, you know, uh, there's this huge group of people that these classes have to cater to, so when you kind of focus on, you know, creating your own opportunities as well, that's where a lot of that great education comes to. That goes hand in hand with what we were talking about earlier with the um, specialization, because you, you saw that, you were like, well, everyone's here for this one kind of main goal, what can I kind of do? What can I seek out myself using these resources to where I can learn even more, you know? And it's it's something that I have to seek out myself. And even 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 the program I was in, it was great because after we would say record all of our final tracks for the final project, then when it was in the mix down stage, a lot of composers were like, "I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea." And in class, it was great because we all had a chance to work on mixes. And uh, I, I was probably one of the best compliments I ever received was from my my kind of my mentor, uh, Professor Dave. Um, 
uh, uh, Greenberg. Uh, he was, um, he was like, you know, if you guys have any questions about mixing, I think go to Kyle. He's kind of like our resident student class mixer, you know. And it, it was very humbling. It was nice. very, it was, it was great, you know, because I learned right from under him from for mixing. Oh, he was like the right. main mixing professor at that uh, campus. And um, but yeah, I mean, I so I would go out of my way to this kind of same thing, like help people with projects that I didn't have to do that, but I was still learning. Because oh, you're doing a country song? Well, I don't, let me let me see what I can do with this here, you know. So I was learning. I treated it as a, as a mock work experience, which I think a lot of people should do when you're in college. That's the whole point. Is this yeah. is a mock real world sort of thing? Absolutely. So, but does it does it, is it necessary to get to get work? That's really yeah, what he's so getting at. Question, and I think yeah. that in the end, you know, yeah, you got to do all that. You know, if you want to be somebody who is capable of whatever it is that you are aspiring to be capable of, study that to the max. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of... Get that done with. It's kind know. of risky, you know, say, go, oh, is it really necessary, like, is the underlying question, right. do I really have to do this? And the question should right. be, you know, like, what do you want to do? And then just go do that. Just right. do it as much as you can. You know, if you've got time for something... And the gig comes up, take the gig, you know. Right. Just, I mean, that's kind of the whole point is of all of this is because we enjoy doing what we do. Well, you know, uh, and maybe going towards back, <laughs> Kyle was bringing us back to, to specializing, you know, y you do have the opportunity to just go your own route. Yes. It's there, you know. Yes. So if your own route is something that you are totally competent at, then you're good, you know, you don't have to. So you don't have to study anything deeper, you know. So you can just like go right on out there and, and go for it. You don't and you're gonna get the the gigs either way, so long as they're looking for that particular thing that you're, you know, specializing in. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Enrique Ponce, uh, I hope I pronounced your, your name your last name right, Enrique. <laughs> um he says, uh, how can you convince directors to spend money that they have available on live musicians when perhaps, I guess, they're reluctant to and you're trying to tell them, well, it'll be more organic or this or that? I definitely have an answer here, but uh, do you guys have any thoughts? Uh, I would just say probably just before that you should ask yourself, do you want live instruments for you or do you want live instruments for the film? Because mm. I know a lot of people who would jump on a... A project to just say that they could write live orchestra for movies. Right, right. I mean, you probably so don't true. want to be like that. So true. Good, great point. Well, I think probably the argument that you could put forth if you needed to, um, let's say, I mean, you, you just got to be, just like Dallas said, you know, you got to be a bit realistic uh, about looking at what what you have in front of you, which is, is your is your, are your samples good enough? Or are your samples weak? You know, maybe you want live musicians because your samples are weak. Well, there's your argument right there. That number one, start there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That'd be good. But what if your samples are really good? Then, you know, are you being realistic with yourself? Do you need to put some live musicians on there or not? Um, and if you believe that you, you do need to, it's going to have to be something along these lines. It's going to have to be because we're not getting the emotion out in this particular spot because one one things that one of the things that real musicians can do better than your samples is push the emotion level much farther. Mm -hmm. So, but that might not be um, an aspect of a particular score. Like if it's a psychological score, that's going to be less kind of emotion based. Although fear is an emotion, but you're just not going to need to like smooth anyone. Yeah, you're not going to need to like be melodramatic or anything or press those those limits so so I imagine this would come up more in just dramas romances com maybe comedy um, just to give that brighter more emotional quality yeah yeah, I would definitely say so. yeah. well um, another thing that I wanted to try to talk about today is uh, atonal scoring mm. and uh, aleatoric scoring and the differences between the two. So first of all, atonal, an atonal score 
contrasts itself from a tonal score. So a tonal score would therefore, you know, use all of the paradigms of, of tonality, whereas an atonal score, um, the way probably Schoenberg tried to do it first, uh, just tries to just jettison all tonal concepts and uh, just be free of rules. That's kind of like the kind of like how atonalism was born. Let's be free of rules. But what was interesting is then people started to come up with systems to organize their music so it would sound organized even though it was kind of atonal, mm. right? Mm. So now it's not tonal harmonically necessarily, um, but it might be organized in some other manner. Um, so you have like, you know, 12-tone scores and, uh, and, and fully atonal scores and scores that don't respect harmony. Um, some of my favorites are uh, are like The Fly, that's a really good yeah. one, by yes. Howard Shore. Um, it has the same uh, presentation of a tonal score. It uses, you know, chords and harmony, and um, it's orchestrated similar to, to a score that you might uh, find in other films. But it's just atonal, and it's just a fantastic score by Howard Shore. That's probably my favorite score of Howard Shore's, and Howard Shore is my favorite living composer, so that really puts it way up there. I wonder yeah. if you guys have any examples. Yeah, I've, I've got a few. I just wanted to say the difference between an atonal score and a tone of score is a lot less than an atonal music piece and a tonal piece, because... You know, film music will navigate and make jumps and odd musical choices as dictated by the drama anyway, so there's a bit of a, you know, sense of atonality and a disrespect for tonality there already. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, Freud by Goldsmith was uh, mm -hmm. one score that kind of, you know, danced that line where there were a lot of moments of, like, pretty moments, you know, like what would sound like traditional harmony and then it would evolve into this ugly, you know, pizzicato kind of stuff with this weird harpsichord kind of dancing through and almost I wonder if the the sense of atonality in film scores where film scores are already pretty atonal anyway the the idea of atonality is a very specific musical genre like like you would see in like a western film anyway you know very particular sound or an action score is very particular well, I, sound. I think you're totally onto something I, the atonal I guess score it's, it's its is a choice yeah. to solve a dramatic uh, or stylistic thing that you're trying to go for, right? Right. So, but but maybe if you realize that, then you can apply it in. You can apply it to where that choice might not be so apparent because you know it's in your bag of potential tricks, right? Right. So you know, like for instance, uh, uh, Three Ten to Yuma by Marco Beltrami. It was western, you know, but it was very daring and and. Um, clever in its tonality and atonality yeah. and, uh, and yet it was a western you know right. it was supposed right. to be a straight ahead western uh, but yeah, it was very refreshing yeah and then if you take actually I think Schoenberg wrote a piece it was like accompanied to a film score and that's like his kind of idea of, of film scoring it's a lot different than what you'd see today in like you know like horror films where you have special effects, you know, barred from like Penderecki or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would count that necessarily as atonal as mm -hmm. much as I would, just very mm. uh, roughly gestural. Right. Well, that uh, goes towards, you know, uh, the next, you know, area of this that we were going to talk about, which is aleatorism, aleatoric yeah. music writing, aleatory, and uh, which comes from the Latin word alia, which is like when you roll dice and create randomness. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do aleatoric writing, you know, you can do, there's a, there's a whole spectrum of uh, things that you can do with aleatoric writing, which is, lends itself more towards like just creating gestures and shapes and overall um, kind of progresses of, of dramatic kind of gestures. And uh, for example, you can create like a cell of a couple of pitches for um, a, a group of instruments to choose from uh, randomly. So everyone, you know, mm -hmm. from 10 people, pick, pick a note, you know, from this little from this little cell, you know, and then once you're there, you know, uh, we're gonna move up in all, you know, octaves across to, you know, three octaves to the end of the instrument. We're all gonna like end up in unison E, high E or whatever, right? Okay. So you can kind of like create these interesting gestures that you know start with like say something completely um, dissonant, dissonant, and then 
and it ends yeah. up a uh, consonant at the end. Um, and that's just one example of, of just hundreds of different ways that you can do aleatoric writing. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if like true aleatoric writing is possible in film scores because in the end you're going to use the take that sounds the best and it's in a controlled environment and then it's always going to play with the film in the exact same way. Yeah. And so it could be, is it aleatoric or is it just... It's controlled is, is randomness. It, yeah, is it just orchestrational shorthand? Is it really, like, I know what I'm doing, but I'll let the players go the last 10%. Well, music is the organization of sound. Yeah. So if you write music and it's aleatoric, it's going to just be your representation of the organization of, of sound. Yeah. Like a truly aleatoric score would have the emotional hit points of the film randomized across <laughs> yeah. the film you know so maybe it's this sad moment but suddenly the uh the circus cue from the first reel comes <laughs> in just randomly that, that would be a trip hilarious what are some also of, yes. i i just had a thought like where i mean aleatoric you what emotion is that expressing i mean i guess it has certain uh, emotional triggers i guess that mm-hmm. It, you wouldn't put it in someone's at someone's birthday party. They're celebrating. Maybe. Unless you're trying to say Maybe. something. I don't know. Maybe because you can do it's something like, yeah. you know, with aleatoric music, you can do something like you could define a phrase. Mm. So you could define like the happy birthday song. Mm-hmm. And then you could define that as like a little motif. And then you tell everybody to randomly start that on different relative pitches between here and here, mm-hmm. but on the modal scale of like, you know... Uh, aeolian between okay. here and here at different points over the next you know three bars enter but once you've entered continue and repeat you know and mm. so it starts to build in in this uh odd way mm. this motif they start they start stacking the building mm. and now you're yeah, you're kind of communicating some idea, or, and it might even work, you know. So it mm-hmm. just depends on how clever you are with organizing mm. instructions, because basically aleatorism is instructions. Mm. It's giving instructions. Yeah, and there's there's not really a there's kind of an illusion of time in film that as you're watching it, it's growing, but it's already been determined from start to finish. So the randomness is not really there, and I don't know if adding it there is really meaningful because the viewer's experience is still the same. They start at the beginning and they watch it till the end. So, <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, I think time, what do you guys think? I think time is a context, you know, and so the first time you see something, you haven't seen it before, and so um, the context unfolds before you over time, and so, yeah, I think everybody, you know, basically... The storytellers, the filmmakers, uh, everyone involved who's creating that big, you know, uh, visual narrative story piece, uh, they're all working together to create something that's going to be watched for the first time by people. It's it's crazy when you think of it that way. But yeah, right. so, you know, I think, you know, but, the, you know, there's, there's, are you going to also make it be like a framed piece of art at the end? You know, that's, you know, that's a next level thing that you can do. But the first fulfilling need is like to satisfy that that first viewing, right? Yeah, um, I was thinking. Come when you mentioned atonal, I was thinking of the Jerry Goldsmith score of, of with Planet of the Apes, and he really used that very effectively. It was like I remember seeing that, and it really with the when the apes were chasing after those people that had been uh, the humans, and they were t- running away. It was like you were really in there yeah. with them, and they were running away, and they were throwing the nets on the humans, and I don't. He was doing this cool like. Ali, yeah, uh, a Tony uh, Universe uh, music. Uh, yeah, it was like, whoa. You felt it, yeah. Yeah, you felt yeah, it. You really that's felt interesting it. sounds. Yeah. 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 When you actually, when you see yourself on the scene, I think that's where it really does come from. And that's an, an interesting example of organizing atonalism because uh, parts of it, I mean, Jerry used it in a free, freely, however he wished, you know, in the moment. Um, but the kind of main theme is 12 tone, the Schoenberg 12 tone. Uh, serial method of writing where you have a series of 12 notes organized in some sequential manner and then you bring them out uh, when you need them. Uh, That's how Jerry used it in the movie. So he has... You know, so he has... Mm. It's all a 12-tone sequence just ordered in a certain way, but, you know, 
you know, the, you know, when you learn it first in school and academic, you're like, <whistles> it doesn't have to be twelve notes in sequence. Right. It could be two, three, five. Whatever. It's actually a, a Tom and Jerry moment where there's it's a fourteen tone row. <laughs> and, uh, Scott Bradley kind of plays it like in retrograde and forwards at the same time. It's kind of funny. Ah, oh, that's funny. It's the makeup for the, the four. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, that's a really good score uh, example of atonalism. And Goldsmith also, which I thought, I'm trying to remember the movie now, but it was some cool sci-fi movie where you're like, at the age of 25, you're like... Logan's some, Run? Yeah, that's it. And he did that with electronic instruments, which was really cool. Like, he, instead oh, yeah. of real instruments, right. like the orchestra, now he transferred it over to the synthesizers, oh, yeah. and it was like, wild. He was doing some really cool... Like, yeah, it was... Yeah. 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 I, th- I think acoustic instruments have the advantage in atonal music because the sounds are interesting and complex, and so you can kind of throw them around, and they're, sh- they're still pretty. But if you have, you know, like really cheap sine waves, just little mm-hmm. blips, they won't have the texture by themselves to really stand together. Yeah. But, you know, with some really nice samples these days and, you know, uh, synthesizer technology. Oh, yeah. You can do some pretty cool stuff. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, I uh, had some examples for aleatoric scoring, I think. Uh, you know, Marco Beltrami uh, did the, uh, scored the sequel to uh, The Thing. Mm. Oh. I don't want to give anything away because this is a pretty awesome major point of the film. Yeah, yeah new movie. But it's related to the original movie, uh, that movie. And uh, But he really, like, took that, um, he did a really great homage, you know, because yes, he, 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 he brought in... Um, at one point, I'm not going to say when, but he brought in all, some of the original score sound, and it was wow, wow. But but the the incredible a- atonal aleatoric, he combined both. He did so you could you could do tonal aleatorism and you could do atonal aleatorism. Mm-hmm. It all depends on how you want to organize your instruction sets. Right. You know, because aleatoric writing is more about just giving an instruction set, which is about choosing randomly something, and then. Tell them how to control that over a period of time. Right. Um, well, in that, and Marco has uh, been always someone who uh, has been doing aleatoric writing. Uh, they call it like the the kinds of specific um, tools or techniques that you would use in aleatoric writing. They call that extended techniques because it's 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 beyond your typical um, uh, music theory. It's like extended music theory, you know. So, you know, so he, uh, Marco Beltrami, is somebody who sort of uh, uh, champions uh, these extended techniques. He built his a lot of his uh, language on them, okay. and since it's gestural in nature, and so are humans, you know, and and story arcs and all that kind of stuff, it really lends itself really well to a lot of, of a lot of uh, films. But uh, it also lends itself well to atonal type of music. And so, therefore, he gets a lot of, you know, monster movies, creature movies, right, right. sci-fi, mm-hmm. uh, the bizarre stuff, you right. know, Steve or with tension, you know. Horror, yeah. But that didn't stop him, or futuristic, but that didn't stop him from doing something that's just, um, uh, you know, has tension. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have to be um, sci-fi or fantasy-based or whatever. But, um, yeah, so he uses extended techniques and aleatoric writing uh, in almost all of his scores. You should check them out, like iRobot. What, what are some great scores, you know, by uh, Marco Beltrami? Um, was uh, Quiet Place just came out. Yeah, yeah Quiet yeah, Place, yeah, boy, was that one. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and uh, was it Gods of Egypt? Oh, gosh, that was so good. Fantastic. Boy, Marco, good job, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> that was really absolutely one. one of the best. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that score to be so good, and it made the movie so good. The movie was really, really brave. Like it took a lot of chances. It, it was. It went off the deep end. Have you guys seen it? No, I haven't seen it. No, there's one sequence that's pretty freaky. Which one? The which one? With the the flat Earth and their. Like fighting on the ship above it. Oh man, yeah. Like God, that's just the beginning. Yeah. There's like a whole afterlife underworld, and it is mm. phenomenal. It was so daring, so brave, and I don't think it. It's like you know, how do you support that kind of, you know, narrative 
braveness, courage with music. It's just, it seems like music would just bring it down. It would just like kind of like cement it into like the traditional things that we would normally, you know, like mm. to experience as a moviegoer. But no, man, Marco like pushed that to the outer limits and uh, the movie itself then just got enhanced and it was... Yeah, that was a great movie. Great movie. The, my favorite uh, film uh, last year was A Quiet Place, and that was with Marco Score. My favorite film when Gods of Egypt came out was Gods of Egypt. And um, I think in between there was Nocturnal Animals was a score yeah, by uh, Gabriel cool. Korosowski. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I, mean, well, I was going to say, I think going back to like more of the internal scores, even something that would be considered more of like a combination would even be like um, Alien 3 was Elliot Goldenthal and it's so funny too because when you when you reference all the soundtracks that came before that for Alien and Aliens they were all a little different they were all focused on the, obviously what they were trying to convey say the first Alien was much more of this it was like Halloween in space there's this one mm -hmm. lone sort of killer trying to and it's taking people out very very systematically so it followed that that very tense kind of like um, just, just, just tension and, and release when it would finally show itself so a lot of that was going on. Aliens was much more of this grander, almost a war film, really, in its own mm -hmm. right. So you had very loud trumpets going off. Uh, the horn section was always kind of the main sort of melody focus. Uh, they would usually have, you know, where some kind of battle sequence going on. But Alien 3, using these, like I said, kind of going with this this combination of Ali Alien Tornik and, and A Tonal, when you had these sort of... Uh, Ripley being on this planet, and she's this she's this prisoner, and you just felt uncomfortable because I mean that that's how she was feeling. She was the only woman on this planet, essentially. Yeah. You know, prison. I don't know how long it's been since you guys have seen it? If you guys saw it, but just being out of place was such a central theme to that whole film, and the music followed that. I mean, perfectly. I mean, it's, I mean, it's people really argue about this about that being a, a really good sequel, but I mean, I, I think what it was trying to present and the ideas and, and showing this more of this evolution of this character and this film franchise going into this very dark sort of path is what it was supposed to be. Uh, I think it really did capture that well. And the soundtrack was, was, was actually very, very well done. It's probably one of my favorite soundtracks in that whole um, series of films, surprisingly. Uh, El Elliot Goldenthal was a student of Aaron Copeland. Oh, okay. And... Um, when you listen to he did the score to Alien Three. I don't know if you mentioned I missed. That yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if you listen to his scores, you know I think he's one of the ones that kind of really brings both of those. Like you just said, you know, aleatoric writing. Yeah, he's even that tonal. Confident. Yeah, yeah. atonal. He's one of the f just phenomenal masters of 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 modern scoring, and it, it's it's too bad he's not scoring still. You know, I don't know what happened. I think that maybe he felt he did his best work. Um, and, and, and yet, he, maybe he even knows uh, there's there's better work potentially down the line. But some people just get disenfranchised, maybe with with sure. Hollywood or yeah, whatever it is. Kinda. But but boy, uh, I sure would love to see him re-enter the scene and and work again. He really did a great job of combining uh, atonalism, tonalism, and aleatoric writing with extended techniques. Yes, all of the above. Like even a Jerry Goldsmith, bold brass writing and percussive writing. Um, on scores like Demolition Man, yes, yes. Uh, Interview with a Vampire, yeah, oh, that know, was pretty, yeah, just pretty about cool. every every score he did was like that. Or uh, Batman and Robin was another yes. one, oh, yeah. very great score actually. Really, I think that that's a very underrated score just because of the film itself. But it very very well done. I, yeah. do, I think that's very excellent. I just wanted to add too as a sequel to Aliens Three. Well, I presume uh, Alien vs Predator with Brian Tyler. His score is also really atonal with a lot of 20th century techniques. Oh, very cool. Oh, interesting. Yeah, really very well interesting. done. Probably a unique score in, in Brian's. Yeah. Um, oeuvre. Repertoire. <laughs> repertoire. Oeuvre. However you say that. Yeah, it's... Oeuvre. Oeuvre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I do want to say that also the score to Alien 4 was really great by a friend of mine, John Frizzell. And uh, mm. I felt that that was even a better ode in a way, to the, the previous way. movies yeah. than even Elliot Goldenthal did with Alien 3. I'm not sure there even was too much of an ode in Alien 3 to Alien 1 and 2. You know, it's, it's Only in the sentimental, I, I was gonna melodic say, work, maybe. I was going to say, I feel like in Alien 3, I, it was definitely, they, they were trying to harken back to some more of those tense moments from Alien, because this wasn't a full-out sort of action kind of war movie with aliens. It wasn't like that at all. So I think 
in a sense, yeah, they did. They weren't trying to play. They weren't trying to say um, bring that back and kind of create a variation. They were trying to create their own thing with it, but they were still trying to create those moments of just uncomfortable tight corridors. You know, your your um, claustrophobia. I felt I felt that. I felt those were maybe some of the concepts they were still trying to kind of maybe bring back from the original Alien for Alien Three. Because I do, I feel like they were they were trying to almost. Like I said, not repeated at all, but they wanted to still push those ideas forward. So it, it fit, at least in my opinion. So absolutely. Well, folks, there you have it. That's this week's so of talking about scoring. Uh, look forward to uh, having you all again and um, talking about all these incredible subjects that uh, keep us going for life. Yes, Thanks, thank and uh, we'll see, see you, you next time. See you. See you guys.